You are now unmuted. Hello. Hello, everyone. You are now muted. You are now unmuted. Okay, so thanks for showing up here. Um, I don't know whether you can hear me. Maybe uh, you can just tell me in the chat whether you can actually hear me. Um, we're in this. Lane can hear. Okay, this is the link to the uh, session if you want to invite someone else who has trouble. Okay, and then we have this etherpad. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, infinite sessions, okay. Uh, and here's the etherpad where we want to take notes. So um, the, the format of this session is a bit different from what you may be used to in terms of uh, conferences in general and also this conference. So uh, I want to experiment with what I called in the abstract a flipped presentation setting. So what I have here is I have prepared three little things like stimulus materials that... Um, contain some of the things I want to talk about. Um, one of them introduces the concept of open research slash open science. Another one uh, introduces Wikidata as one component of the Wikimedia ecosystem. Uh, and this other one uh, introduces the interactions between the two. Uh, but if you're attending this session, I assume that you have some ideas about um, the interactions already, or you want to learn about certain aspects of them. And uh, so this session is not meant to be a monologue by myself. That's why I, I link to those three monologues that already have been held. And I want to try to have a dialogue here. What are the things that uh, Wikimedia and the e research ecosystem are already interacting about or uh, through which channels, through which mechanisms do they interact? Which of these interactions do you find interesting or problematic or um, otherwise remarkable. And then uh, how can we think further? What further interactions would be beneficial or problematic or otherwise interesting, basically? So that's uh, the basic uh, premise framing of this session. And uh, I see we're not too many here. Um, so um, feel free to just jump in, don't be afraid. Um, and uh, in the, the best way to do this is uh, to um, just uh, type questions out in the etherpad at the bottom so that we have an easy record that we can then refer to and uh, that uh, we can then share um, the uh, ideas about. But since we're a small group, it's also fine if you just unmute yourself and start talking. Uh, if you have a particular idea, particular topic or so that you think we should be discussing here. I have some starting points that I have prepared um, based on feedback I got on Twitter when I announced this session. I also have uh, some, some basically these slides behind the 10 media, minute video. I have that ready. And so these are some starting points, but essentially it is a bring your own thought session. So please uh, let some of your thoughts out now and I'll, I will uh, start listening or reading uh, what happens here. And if you find this format very odd, then that's also uh, something to comment on because this is the first time I'm doing it this way. Okay, I see someone starting to type. Okay. Okay, yeah, nice set of questions. So um, I will just start uh, in line 36, current line 36. No one respects Wikipedia. Is it stable? Will it go away? How does anyone begin to think about it? Okay, 
that's um, a lot to chew on, and you just uh, interrupt me when I'm going astray here. And uh, I'm I'm sharing my entire screen, so you see what I see. Um, if something is happening, like in the big blue button chat or something, I don't see this, but we have a moderator who will inform me. Um, so no one respects Wikipedia. Uh, maybe uh, that's not the first one to to start. Is it stable? Um, so there are a number of things that you, we could discuss uh, in terms of stability. One is like server uptime, and there um, it's probably amongst the best that you can find on the web, uh, especially considering your traffic. Will it go away? Um, yes, um, lots of people have, um, well, <laughs> essentially everything humanity does will go away at some point, but uh, let's say, will it go away within the next five or 10 years? And lots of people have made that this uh, pre prediction uh, more than five or ten years ago, and it still hasn't gone away. Um, another aspect of, in terms of stability is the content. Um, so, of course, uh, Wikipedia and the entire ecosystem is built on the concept of a wiki, so that essentially anything can change, and in that sense it's very unstable. Um, you can have two versions that differ wildly, or that... Um, two versions of the same article, essentially, that give you uh, opposite impressions uh, of a particular uh, topic. Um, is it stable in terms of the community? Um, that uh, is also uh, it's a, an evolving system. The community has been growing until about 2007 in most of the larger Wikipedias, and since then, in uh, most of the larger Wikipedias, large by number of articles that they have, um, the community is actually shrinking. So in that sense, that is not necessarily stable. Um, on the other hand, there are a number of languages um, that um, have relatively smaller number of articles, um, which is still often larger than many of the other uh, encyclopedias that might exist in those languages. Um, and for those languages, many of them, uh, the community is still growing. Other aspects of stability are, for instance, financial stability. So um, Wikipedia has an annual funding drive, um, which actually does not go to Wikipedia itself. It goes to some of the organizations that help administer Wikipedia. Uh, the most prominent one is the Wikimedia Foundation, and uh, so they own the trademarks, they run uh, essentially most of the servers. Um, and uh, so they provide technical support and ensure that the system is up. They, they are to blame if uh, the servers are up as expected or if they are not up. Um, and uh, this funding drive typically makes an argument, well, if everyone who sees this ad uh, were to give uh, like, some donation, uh, like what is it, one dollar or something like this, then this funding drive would be over in a very short time, um, which basically speaks to the reach of the platform. And in the end, it is one of the largest um, donation exercises in the world. There, you have millions of people donating a few, um, the equivalent of a few dollars each on average. Um, and so this means that the Wikimedia Foundation, on average, earns on the order of $100 million a year, and that is then spent on various things. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is not the only uh, organization in this community. There are others, uh, like organizations that are organized by country, like Wikimedia Sweden, France, um, and Korea, and so on. Um, and... Um, then there are also organizations that are organized by topic, like Wikimedia Medicine, um, or by language, like uh, the uh, Catalan uh, Friends of Wikipedia, and things like that. Um, someone asked me on 45, are we live on audio? I assume so, if you can hear me. Uh, can someone please confirm in the etherpad that you can hear me? Yes, someone says yes, uh, they can hear me. So oh, I don't know we what to say. We can hear you? Uh, yes, you can, you can also say that you can hear me. That's completely fine. As I said, we're a small number of people here in this group. And um, if you want to, in, if you prefer to just talk, then just do. I, I, um, but 
I, I actually like the way this, this works out here in this etherpad. You give me some things to talk about um, and I just comment on this. But if you want to comment on something, then by all means, just um, do as you just did, interrupt my um, presentation by putting some words in, in there and then just go ahead and talk about it. Where was I? Uh, oh yeah, that we have organizations by basically geographic location, by topic, and also by language. Uh, and they are in flux, but I would say more or less stable. Uh, the big problem is most of those actually don't have um, stable funding, um, whereas the funding for the Wikimedia Foundation is relatively stable because of the large community and, and administers the funding stream for most of the community actually. Um, but for some parts of the community, uh, the funding is not so um, secure. Um, on the other hand, we have a few exceptions where the funding is um, rel relatively even more secure. That is, for instance, in Poland and Italy, there are uh, mechanisms in the tax system where the taxpayers can indicate that a certain amount of their taxes goes to a charity of their choosing. And some of those people choose uh, the respective Wikimedia chapter, like Wikimedia Poland or Wikimedia Italy. And that is another revenue uh, stream, uh, which then helps uh, the um, Wikimedia chapters in Poland and Italy to organize some of their uh, activities. Um, okay, so that was just line 36. How does what anyone begin to think about it? Uh, well, uh, I, I think I gave some ideas on how this works. Um, the, um, there, there are lots of other things uh, that, uh, that we can use to start thinking about it. One is uh, by this encyclopedia thing. What, why did people start encyclopedias? What other encyclopedias have been started? Uh, what is their current status? Uh, to what extent, or what was their mission? And to what extent do they still f fulfill their mission? What is the mission of the Wikimedia Foundation? Or uh, what is the mission of Wikipedia? Why does Wikipedia not exist on its own, why is there an entire ecosystem around uh, Wikipedia? Um, and uh, then how does that interact with the world around it? And some aspect of the world around it is the research ecosystem, which is one, what I want to focus on in this session. We are already 12 minutes in, and it has been largely a monologue here. So I would still, I would uh, re-encourage you to uh, go in and um, yeah, interact with the etherpad or just take the microphone if you have a comment. Otherwise, I will just go through the things that pop up here uh, in the etherpad. Um, is there a truly diverse audience perspective that builds the base? Hmm. Uh, I, that rings lots of bells here. Uh, truly diverse probably doesn't exist. Um, then the second thing is Wikipedia is a product of the internet and so um, it already is a, there is a selection bias uh, for those people who do or do not have internet. Uh, then uh, by the nature of how it is set up, it is, uh, it comes or it, it triggers or correlates with lots of other biases. Um, in the end, it's largely dominated by uh, people from the Western world, especially males from the Western world, uh, who are in a relatively stable position uh, so they don't have to uh, think about hunger or having a home or anything like that. So their basic needs of life, they're essentially assured. And so they can in engage in some of their spare time uh, to share whatever knowledge they have or are acquiring with the rest of the world. Um, and of course, lots of people on the planet are not in that situation. They do not have regular access to internet. They may not even have regular access to food or drinking water or um, things like that, sanitation. And uh, that is then reflected on the things that you find on Wikipedia and in the broader e ecosystem, because uh, since the majority of the people who contribute are volunteers who do that in their spare time, they will talk and write about the things that they are interested in. And if we are missing a large part of the human population, then those things that, uh, that those parts of the, um, those missing parts of the human population are interested in, they may not be appropriately reflected. And uh, another um, aspect of this bias is of course the language. So uh, Wikipedia was initially started in English and then it branched out into many other uh, languages, but still English is kind of uh, the dominant language in the, in the ecosystem. 
uh, as it is in the research ecosystem and also here uh, for, for this particular uh, conference, the Flash Forward Fest, I s uh, assume that uh, people for whom English is the native language are actually a minority, but nonetheless, essentially all the sessions are given in English. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, on the other hand, since lots of, let's say, niches within the Wikimedia ecosystem exist where different languages um, are spoken or are the only uh, means of communication, uh, the Wikimedia ecosystem as a whole actually does promote uh, lots of aspects of diversity, uh, especially language, but also uh, cultural heritage. There are lots of activities in terms of promoting cultural heritage and natural heritage, so biodiversity. Um, and um, in, in that respect, uh, Wikimedia community members also interact with lots of other um, volunteer and professional organizations that uh, address diversity. Plus, there, there are official policies, but uh, the link between official policies and actual practice is not always the strongest in Wikimedia or in, in other contexts. Um, line 43, should research be open? Should it not be done by experts? Oh, that's a big one. So, um, it, to some extent, um, so this 90 second video that I link here uh, on line, current line 19, this addresses that. It's also included in the Wikipedia article on open research and has been sitting there for like a decade now. <laughs> um, so uh, I certainly think that research should be open by default. I could imagine uh, conditions where uh, it should not be open or not entirely open. So for instance, about uh, patient privacy or uh, rare species. If, if you discovered the last uh, re breeding colony of a certain endangered species, you may not want to uh, publish the precise coordinates of that so that um, people can go in uh, and, and basically destroy that uh, last remaining colony. Um, so there are a number of um, contexts in which uh, research should not be open, but I think uh, for the vast majority of research, way more uh, about it should be public than currently is the case. Especially, I think it's important to make the process more open and that kind of goes to the second question on this line 43, should it not be done by experts? Yes, of course, experts should be critically involved, but that does not mean that they have to do everything or that you are only allowed to participate if you are an expert. Also, uh, most of the research actually takes place at the interface between two different things that we do know and then something that we don't know. Uh, so you typically study some sort of a system with some sort of a methodology and you may know the system or the methodology or both, but somewhere at that interface between the system and the methodology, there is something unknown. And so you would need people who are an expert in the system and you would need people who are an expert in the uh, method and probably people with some other qualifications as well. St statistics and data science are um, very important across all different fields, um, but also ethics and a number of other um, let's say, best practices in data management, things like that. And uh, here, experts can help guide uh, the system and build workflows, but ideally they should be uh, built such that anyone can participate uh, in, at least in a productive way, so not in a, in a spammy way. Um, and um, this is actually happening in a number of uh, circumstances. So the best known example is probably citizen science, um, which is called such just to uh, differentiate it from those who do science professionally. And uh, in those citizen science projects, typically a, an aspect or several aspects of a research project are opened up such that uh, the public and people who are not experts in that particular topic can participate. Um, the problem I see with the citizen science approach is that they do not open up the entire process. Um, or very often they don't. Um, and I think the citizens would be even more engaged if they would have a um, broader say in how the project is actually being shaped, um, what topics are being addressed, also if the final outputs would actually be available to them. Many citizen science projects, they publish their research in traditional scholarly ways, which means the article itself, the narrative is behind a paywall, 
the data is not shared or not shared in a, in a way that a normal person can easily access. And uh, the software that was used uh, in the process is not shared and all of that makes it really difficult uh, to engage with people who are not part of the infrastructure. Um, open science projects try to do this differently. So uh, for them, it is normal to uh, document the process as it goes on, including like uh, documenting the, the mistake you just did five minutes ago. Uh, all of this will be visible. Um, and uh, then if you produce data, this will be open. Uh, if you produce code, this will be open and open in the sense that others can reuse it, but also in the sense that others can scrutinize it and maybe point out, oh, look, here you're, you're doing something that actually is not the, the best approach. Look over there, uh, they've solved this problem uh, a while ago and uh, this is better because of X, Y, Z. Um, and so this kind of feedback early on in the process can actually really help improve the, uh, the research. And this is different from the way uh, research currently works when the first line of feedback on a uh, piece of research is anonymous peer review of the grant proposal uh, where essentially they don't give you a good reason why you're, you're chosen or why you're uh, not selected. And then once you proceed, the next round of re review is after you finish the research and then they may point out, oh, look, it would have been better if you had done this additional experiment or if you had had a control group or something like this. But if you do it in an open science fashion, you can get feedback even before you sub, uh, apply for funding uh, or you can get contribu uh, contributions even if, if your project is not funded and all these kinds of things. Um, and you can learn in the process. That's uh, kind of coming back to the experts thing. Experts are experts in a very narrow field. Uh, even if you move away from that a little bit, they're not expert anymore. And so uh, they are learning, even experts are learning all, all the time. And uh, to some extent, this learning can be uh, made a more collaborative endeavor. Um, and I think this should also be encouraged and open science should be uh, thought of more as an educational resource for people in the field, but also when teaching about a particular subject. Uh, I have often uh, participated in such uh, let's say science days where the public in, uh, interacts with uh, researchers directly and then I've taken them on a tour through open notebooks like o notebooks of people who are doing science right now and uh, they're fascinated by that and in a way it's strange that uh, humanity has uh, worked out mechanisms that we can be informed about things like a football match or so in precise detail and we have built big stadiums where people can watch uh, these football matches and they those football matches they don't contribute much to like humanity's future or so but science does and science if you think about a um, project of um, research typically you have a rough idea of where you want to go but then in, in, in the end you typically end up in a slightly different uh, place and you have lots of emotions on the way and if we had mechanisms to show uh, those emotions, then uh, it would probably not be that difficult to get the uh, public excited about this. When in the uh, Middle Ages uh, they performed the famous experiment with the uh, evacuated hemispheres, so they had an, a number of um, basically spheres that were um, from metal and th uh, then they evacuated uh, the air from that, and then they had horses pull those evacuated spheres and uh, essentially everyone in the area uh, wanted to see this experiment and uh, everyone came. That was a time when we were much, much less enlightened than we are now, when people had much less background about uh, why science uh, is important for their lives. And still they came, they watched this. And uh, I think uh, we can take inspiration from such things. And uh, open science allows to do this actually at a scale that we haven't had before. Okay, um, what about citations? Actually, this line 44. Uh, so this is uh, one comment that also intersects with uh, some of the comments I got from Twitter. So um, on Twitter, they said I should absolutely mention Wikisite. And so I will do that. And uh, there's an, a related project structured data on Wikisource. So let me briefly explain that. So. Wikisite is a 
an initiative that is aimed at uh, basically um, collecting information about which information is cited. It started out as an uh, attempt to keep track of things that are actually cited outside, no, no, from the Wikimedia system, but they point outside. So, for instance, an article cited on a scholarly article cited on, in a Wikipedia article, or um, a file on Wikimedia Commons that was imported from an open access scholarly article and then cites that open access article. And for those circumstances, we need to keep track of the metadata because um, Wikipedia and the entire ecosystem is openly licensed, but it uses licenses that require attribution and basically uh, linking back to the source. And so we have basically obligate, an obligation by virtue of the licenses that we use to be precise about uh, where the information comes from. There, and there's another layer of this obligation that is because everybody can contribute to the ecosystem, it is very important to facilitate verifiability, to make it easy for anyone else who sees anything in a Wikipedia article or elsewhere in the ecosystem that they can go and check. Um, which helps them uh, train their, let's say, fact-checking and active thinking skills. Um, but if you just put out a statement there um, without any way to verify this, then you're basically in the realm of much of the social media. Um, and then you run into problems of misinformation being amplified because it's more interesting than the actual information and so on. And so Wikisite tries to collect information about things that are being cited and is developing data models like uh, what are the things uh, that characterize a scholarly article uh, and whether it's published in a journal or in a, uh, as part of a book or uh, a conference series or something like this. How does that um, differ from uh, if you're citing a court case or a poem or a video or something like this? And all of that is being collected in a structured fashion using a sister project to Wikipedia, which is Wikidata. In Wikidata, you have individual pages for concepts, largely the same as in any Wikipedia, but you don't have full text there. You have um, structured uh, information that is essentially filling out form fields. Those form fields can be filled out by volunteers or by automated processes. And they then allow you to um, browse the information in a way that um, browsing text um, does not allow you. The classical example for Wikidata is give me a list of uh, all the uh, major cities in the world that have a female mayor. In order to address that question, you need to have a list of all the major cities in the world. You need to know uh, who their, uh, what their population is, basically. You need to know who their mayor is and he, you need to know the gender of the mayor. Um, and uh, then basically um, asking Wikidata for this list of people is just a query to the database. Whereas if you would try to find the answer to such questions by browsing Wikipedia, you could end up in that um, proverbial rabbit hole of, of Wikipedia. Um, yeah, and so Wikisite it was originally named Wikiproject Source Metadata, which is still um, the um, name it has on Wikidata. But since it is um, basically combining interactions between all the different uh, parts of the Wikimedia ecosystem, um, Wikisite is maybe a better name. It's easier to pronounce, easier to keep in mind. And that has another component, that is the citation graph. And here we're actually keeping track of the citations of external pieces, not necessarily a citation from a Wikipedia article, um, but a citation between, let's say, a scholarly article and a book chapter or something like this. Okay, um, I put in a link here from line 32. And uh, yeah, we actually had a Wikisite conference in um, October. Maybe someone can put in the uh, link here uh, to that, which has much more information on that topic. Um, then. Structured wiki source is basically a, a, a similar, a related idea. So wiki source is a sister project to Wikipedia, and which um, tries to uh, accurately represent the content of certain sources that are cited from Wikipedia. So for instance, you have the US constitution there, and you have lots of articles published in 
um, journals and magazines in the 18th century. You have um, poems by Goethe and things like that. Um, and uh, in Wikisource, the idea there it, it is using a wiki, but still the idea is to use the wiki just to perfect the um, representation of that original work. And uh, so once this representation is stable, that, that goes back to the other aspect of stability, then Wikisource is not meant to be edited anymore, uh, though it can still be annotated. Like if, for instance, uh, a name of a place or so is there in this text and it's not annotated in the original, Wikisource can actually annotate. Oh, it's referring to this um, name of the city, like Newtown. There are so many places named Newtown. And uh, so um, in Wikisource, you can clarify which one this is referring to. Or if uh, in Wikisource they're talking about a particular Jane Smith, you can then um, clarify which Jane Smith this is. And um, in Wikimedia Commons, which is the media repository for this ecosystem, well, we now have a um, project called Structured Data, where we keep structured data about the files that are in Wikimedia Commons. So. Uh, who created the file? When crea uh, was the file created? What's the file format? What's the file size? What's the licensing? These kinds of things. That's structured information that can be read by machines. And the proposal here is that Wikisource uh, should get a similar structured uh, counterpart. And that would, of course, interact with Wikisite in various ways. And the proposal for uh, this structured uh, data on Wikisource is here. I'll briefly skim what uh, has been written further below because we're about halfway through the session. If anyone wants to say something, now's a good time to come in. That gives me a, a moment to breathe and to look at what, the, uh, what has been written here um, below. So I'll wait for a, a minute or so and then just read through the things that, that have been posted here. Okay, I hear silence <laughs> in, in some languages, they would say crickets. Uh, I actually would like to hear crickets, uh, but I would also like to hear your thoughts. Um, so I'll just continue then. So um, we have a few things we haven't talked about yet. So uh, what about citations? How will researchers be cited? Will the citation remain, be published to go back to? Okay. Um, so. Citations I already spoke about a little bit in the context of Wikisite. Um, but citations exist in different forms in this universe, uh, in, in this Wikimedia universe. And also there are practical differences, or in some uh, circumstances there are differences between references, citations, and sources. The source is the original thing that you want to cite and in order uh, to, uh, you actually want to reference, you want to, <laughs> Uh, refer to information that is contained in the original. In order to do that, you need to uh, add a citation. You may have to make it clear to others how they can find, how they can navigate to that original, essentially. Um, yeah, and uh, so that is something we could facilitate that so that the verification process of the information that is in the Wikimedia ecosystem uh, could be simplified. And keeping in mind of the session scope where we want to look at the interactions. I think as having a similar system in science would also actually be more uh, very useful. So of course, the cit uh, original citation practices, they come more or less out of the sciences or uh, writ large, including philosophy and other fields. Um, uh, but uh, very often the focus there is not really on enabling people to verify the information. It is more or less, at least re in recent years, focused on uh, giving certain kinds of credits to the people who've produced the cited information. And uh, then citations are being used for evaluating um, the performance of researchers. Uh, but the problem is this only works with things that can actually be cited. 
um, in, uh, that are being cited. And so very often data sets, for instance, software uh, or cell types and other material uh, things that come out of the research process, they are not really uh, cited um, as much. And so that um, kind of work or producing these kinds of resources receives less recognition in the science ecosystem. And uh, that uh, creates um, problems. So here in line 59, uh, someone wrote uh, incentives. Yeah, there's a paper about the pers perverse incentives in the research ecosystem because uh, the researchers are more or less trained or required or otherwise uh, driven towards uh, publishing as, as much as possible and reusability, impact on society and um, things like that, they're not really high on the, uh, on the agenda. This is often forgotten in the way research is being evaluated and also in the way it interacts with uh, ecosystems like the free knowledge movement uh, of which Wikipedia is a big part. And um, so, yeah, these are problems. Then also, how will researchers be cited? Well, for researchers, uh, at least those that are in academia, it's very important that they get recognition for their work and that recognition typically amounts to um, citations and or like um, their work being published in a reputable journal. Um, the approach in Wikipedia uh, is completely different. Your contributions, they're always visible for those who want to know, but um, it's more important that you contribute to an overarching uh, bigger thing. And instead of writing a new review article on a topic every year, which is essentially the business model of some scholarly journals, Wikipedia just writes one thing and updates it whenever there is something to update. And everybody who has something to contribute to that update, they just do it. And then they will be essentially referred to as a Wikipedia contributor. They can't um, go out and, and say, oh, look, I, my uh, article was published in so-and-so venue, um, but they contributed to a place where the information is actually accessible to people and uh, where people actually look for it. <laughs> uh, when you have a particular scholarly uh, publication on a given topic um, and it was published in... Journal X, you have typically no idea where the next relevant paper on that particular topic is going to be published. But in Wikipedia, you will know if there is something relevant to that particular topic or, um, of that particular article that you're looking at, at some point it will enter that uh, Wikipedia article or at least a talk page. Someone will make a note, look, there is this other scholarly article that in intersects with what is discussed here, maybe we can work it in. And that is essentially a much more useful way of structuring knowledge but yes, the individual ego of the researcher uh, is not uh, as much in focus as it is in the current research ecosystem. Can um, we talk about that a moment? Okay, can you um, rephrase the question or um, add some more yeah. points? So, so, by the way, my name's Andrew Renz, um, and I've got a foot in the world of academe and then also a foot in a very different world of access to knowledge. And the resistance that I've encountered um, trying to get people to open up their research has precisely to do with this fear of being scooped. Their first article on something gets cited more often. If you try and you, you, you could formulate um, research a thousand times better, in my opinion, than somebody else. And... Um, and and yet you'll be told, oh, no, no, X, Y, D, D did this first. You've never read their things. You've come to your, your, um, to your conclusions independently. So this is even without a lot of openness. And you're told, no, 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 it's already been done. So this obsession with novelty um, is, I think, a major problem. And, and until some of the incentives are, are, are changed... Um, and they could be changed simply by having open science and then people, you know, acknowledging. If, 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 if scholarly norms were different, um, then, you know, and people said, well, oh, this person, you know, they, they produced the data and I quickly wrote it up. And, and, and if the scholarly norm was, well, the person who did the data is, you know, at least as important, if not more, than the person who wrote it up, they're truly the pioneer here, then I think the incentives would be aligned. But right now... If you produce the data, then 
you run a real risk that other people will write it up. And I'm not happy about this, Sean. I'm not, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying, to me, this is the central problem. Um, and I, I don't know if other people think there's, you know, there's, there's ways around it or, um, you know, what do we do? Do we just okay. sort of try uh, and change the incentive? Yeah. Thanks. I think I, I have an idea of what, what you have in mind, and I have an idea on how to respond. Um, so, um, a, and there, there are very various ways in which to respond, and this is an old question, uh, basically as old as the idea of open science, this uh, is one of the primary objections to it. Um, on the other hand, if you do open science, this means that you have laid out your ideas in public, and so um, you they may be wherever you choose. They might be on a wiki on GitHub or uh, in, in other places. There's even a journal that publishes research ideas. And um, then once you have those ideas out in public and you basically take your notebook out in public, then uh, people can, of course, take any ideas there and ideas can travel very quickly. And if they travel to people who have more resources than yours, then yes, uh, some of them might actually do what you wa uh, wanted to do and they will then publish and they might not attribute you as the source of the in initial inspiration. On the other hand, um, most scientists, I would say, are honest and they are trained to always indicate the sources where they got some idea from. And also for those who are dishonest, they can do so actually easier in the current system where you have to submit your uh, research ideas to some funding agencies. It is being reviewed by people who you do not know, just like on the internet, you don't know who is accessing your ideas that are openly accessible there. And then uh, in addition to that, those people who, and, and, and who review for the funding agencies, they essentially have the power to say, no, you're not allowed to do that work because we are not gonna give you the funding. But some of them actually might be in a position to uh, to have the funding and the means to actually do the research that you have proposed. And uh, if there is no public trace of that, it's very hard to show that they have stolen uh, your idea. Uh, when your idea is out in public, it will still be hard to show that they uh, stole it from you. Uh, and stealing here means that they publish without mentioning you. But at least you can then make the case, but yeah, it was actually me who published this two, two years ago or so. Um, and there's yet another, there, well, there are many more angles. Um, most people that I know of who engage in research, they have way more ideas they, uh, than they could ever implement in their lifetime. And so, and also they are genuinely interested in most of the ideas that, uh, that they have. Uh, and so if someone else actually were to implement uh, one of my ideas, uh, that means I have more time for the other ideas, and um, that uh, is also an aspect to consider. Of course, if then uh, those who run with my idea and don't even mention me, if they get all the funding at some point, I will have trouble uh, sustaining myself or sustaining my research or sustaining the people with whom I collaborate or sustaining the infrastructure that I use for my research. And uh, so, yes, the system needs to be balanced, but uh, I think uh, the, um, the current system is not necessarily um, better in terms of not being scooped. And also, yes, if you are doing your things in public, you can easily show that uh, you have priority. Um, then uh, I put some notes on the bottom. So there are actually some policy changes. Since you were cha talking about changing the incentives, yes, there are some policy changes. So uh, PLOS and eLife have changed their policy such that if you think there was a paper uh, that uh, published, uh, I think anywhere, um, and you think that is a scoop of a research that you're performing, they will accept your paper within six months of that other paper having been published. Um, which means basically the novelty aspect goes away. Um, at, at least if you can finish the write up within six months, which seems reasonable. Um, there's also other aspects to it. Um, lots of the um, research pieces that get published first, especially in those fields where there is a race, they then later have problems with re reproducibility, maybe because they cut corners. They did not wait until they have enough statistical power in their sample, or they uh, did not have enough expertise in a certain area to actually review this, whether it uh, actually makes sense to 
use that concentration of, of that solution in that uh, situation and things like that. Um, and so I think we should place a higher uh, value on the actual reproducibility. And so maybe those who publish first and those who reproduce their research first, they should be considered as a, as a team and then be rewarded together. And that would actually enhance the, the value, the you know, social status of those who reproduce and of those who are reproduced. Uh, and that would give incentives to both of these uh, to actually do this, uh, engage in this reproducibility and the re reproduction. And the same could be said about reusability. Uh, I think if funding agencies were to ask, uh, like, who has reused your data sets or your software or your research, uh, rather than who has cited it or you know, what journal name stood on the cover of your publication, then that would change the dynamics of how willingly uh, people would share their research. Um, if your funding depends on your prior research having been reused by somebody else, that's a completely different game. And uh, it is uh, a game that would actually encourage contributing to the commons and uh, people actually engaging, making their data findable rather than um, hiding it away from, uh, from potential reusers or reproducers. Okay, I think that's um, in, in broad strokes what I would like to say about being scooped. Um, we have a similar set of uh, problems here in line 59, the problems of incentives. Um, we have talked about some of them a bit already, fear of being criticized. Yeah, maybe uh, let's talk about this one a little bit. So. Uh, and again, the, uh, the attitudes in the Wikimedia and the research ecosystem, they, they are not exactly the same. So in the uh, Wiki, let's start with the Wikipedia ecosystem. Um, one way of criticizing someone else is just going in and fixing whatever they wrote, uh, fixing from your perspective. Uh, but on the other hand, if uh, they think that you fixed it the wrong way, they can go back and uh, fix it in a different way. And there are limits to how you can do this back and forth. So there's a term for this called edit boring. And essentially, you can only do this twice. If you do it the third time, then you should uh, go into a different mode of um, interaction. Basically, there's discussion, there's community processes, and things like that. So one mechanism for um, basically uttering or engaging in criticism is just to go in and change the very thing that you want to criticize, which I think is, is a very good way um, of engaging in general, also in society. If someone says, oh, uh, it's really bad that there's all this litter uh, lying around here in the park that I'd like to go to. Well, what about helping to um, remove the existing litter and then think about mechanisms by which uh, further accumulation of litter could actually be um, reduced um, rather than just um, complaining somewhere. So that's one thing. It really, the, the Wiki ecosystem encourages active uh, criticism in the sense of fixing whatever problem you uh, notice. But sometimes the problem might just be too big or it might be something that you are competent enough to notice as a problem but maybe not competent enough to fix or maybe it's not a problem of your competence, it's a problem of your time or you notice it in a language that you're not comfortable in, blah blah. So there's multiple um, dimensions to this. Uh, the point is you can fix certain things on the spot and then there's other channels to engage in discussion. If you notice something wrong in science, well, it's much more complex. So for instance, uh, there are big scholarly databases like PubMed, they have tens of thousands of invalid uh, DOIs, digital object identifiers. <laughs> and there's no easy mechanism to uh, notify them of this. You can ping them on Twitter. You can, uh, there's a mechanism by which you can tell them individually for each of the entries in their database, look here, this one is wrong. But if you have this at the scale of tens of thousands, it doesn't work. If you find a problem in a paper that was published, that paper is essentially immutable. Um, and then uh, you have to decide. Uh, so let's say that, uh, they just got uh, a, a unit wrong. Instead of a kilogram, they wrote a milligram or something like this, which is a, um, an error of like a million. Um, but still, it's just one letter, right? And uh, then the question is, what's the best mechanism to go there? Well, of course, you can use mechanisms like hypothesis. You can annotate that kilogram and say, this should actually be a, a microgram. What did I say? Milligram, whatever. Uh, this should be this way. And, um, but then the question is, how many people will see your annotation? 
um, you can write a commentary where you say, oh, yeah, they should actually, uh, they got this error in, in the unit. You can write to the author, you can write to the editor. All of these things are, um, they give unpredictable results and also they're, they give results that are inconsistent across the ecosystem, even within a, one journal. And then, of course, there are lots of problems with uh, existing publications that are much more than just a typo uh, that changes like kind of the unit. Uh, and some of them are actually fundamental issues where you just um, interpret things in a different fashion, but you don't deny the actual data, things like that. Um, and the, the way these things um, are being handled is just you, you add another publication, typically somewhere else, or maybe even as a letter to the editor, uh, to that particular uh, journal where the original thing was, was published. But this might be weeks or months or sometimes years after that actual thing, actual error occurred. So it's so disconnected. Whereas on Wiki, if you notice something, you can go in and then uh, it can be fixed often within seconds or minutes or at least days. Um, and so the dynamics of this criticism are completely different. Um, formal research funding. Uh, da -da -da -da. I think open science can help researchers, experts learn. Okay, let's let's go on, on this learning thing a little bit. We have less than 10 minutes left. So if anyone here still wants to say something, please do just interrupt me. Uh, otherwise, I will spend the, the rest on this maybe on just education. So um, in education about essentially any topic, uh, whether you're uh, at primary school level or at university level, you often work with textbooks or, or other resources that are essentially quite old, or uh, you work on, let's say, quizzes and problems that uh, lots of other people have already solved. And uh, the question is whether we can improve on, on that model. And here, the Wikimedia ecosystem um, actually um, provides lots of mechanisms. Um, let me just take a note of something else that just crossed my mind. Uh, I'll get back to that uh, at the end. So, for instance, um, it could be a task to a student, um, read the Wikipedia article on X in your language, um, and then uh, see whether you can improve it. And that is actually a task that uh, from the teacher's perspective can, can be given every, every time they run this course, but uh, the task that the student would actually do would be different every time because the, um, the article uh, would be in a different shape and the circumstances would be uh, different. It, the information there would be outdated to a different degree. There might be new information available. So that is a very, uh, let's say, uh, that's a task that can be used very scalably across topics and also across kinds of courses. And then if the article does not exist in the language of concern, then uh, of course creating this article could be uh, another task. Um, this is a one-off <laughs> per language. Um, but um, once, once that is achieved, it basically enters this uh, cycle that I just uh, outlined. And in the creation of this article, lots of things that are normally um, basically taught by giving homeworks of a kind, please write an essay on X, Y, Z, um, they could also be taught. And that includes actually handling of references, justification of arguments, neutral point of view. That's something I haven't really mentioned yet. If there is a debate about a certain topic in the Wikimedia ecosystem, um, typically that debate needs to be reported in, in neutral fashion. Uh, so you say voice A, uh, says this, voice B says this, and voice C says that voice A is more important than voice B or something like this. Um, and then all of this is backed up with references that actually um, um, hold whatever A, B, and C have, have said. Um, and uh, this is some of the things that students learn when they write essays or, or similar narratives uh, for, for their homework and those narratives that you typically write at school or uh, at university they typically end up in the dustbin they're read by one of your teachers or maybe two something like this uh, but here if you contribute to the Wikimedia ecosystem 
uh, they might be read by hundreds or thousands of people within uh, days or sometimes even hours. And some of them will actually go in and they in then engage with that. And so if you have written a piece of text on a particular topic and someone goes in and then uh, sl slightly changes it, that teaches you something typically. Um, of course, sometimes it's just spam that teaches you about spam you m wouldn't want to know about, but very often it's actually refinements, uh, something that you hadn't thought about when you were writing this. And then someone brings in a new piece of information that you just weren't aware of or you didn't think was worthy including, including or things like that. And so there is this kind of uh, conversation that uh, could also be referred to as a dance. You're dancing with the other contributors and um, you, so you wouldn't make movements if it weren't for the movements of the others. And uh, this is very educational. Also, um, the entire ecosystem is openly licensed and I can't stress this enough because many of the teaching materials, they are licensed such that you are not allowed to actually reuse them in any other context. So the typical textbook is copyrighted by some publisher that copyright expires long after you're dead. And uh, so the, uh, and if you use this in public, um, then basically you run into legal problems. Whereas if you use anything from Wikipedia, um, you're legally allowed to do so. Um, of course, you should still evaluate the quality of whatever you, uh, you find there. Um, but that's the case for any material you should be using for your own learning or for teaching anybody. And uh, Wikipedia just kind of highlights this necessity um, to uh, verify your sources and um, the claims in there. Um, so yeah, that was a quick excursion into teaching. And um, on that note, uh, so some journals, for instance, they have uh, educational materials in, in them. And uh, if the journals are openly licensed, then uh, lots of their materials will eventually find their way into the Wikimedia ecosystem. Um, and one way in which this is uh, facilitated is some journals like PLOS Computational Biology, for instance, they have an article track that actually publishes um, things uh, like articles on a specific topic. And uh, this article is then published in parallel on the English Wikipedia. We have an example. Uh, on this, uh, like from, from earlier this year, it's chemical graph generators. So you can go into English Wikipedia and look at that article. Um, this article was first written uh, such that it could be published in the, the journal plus computational biology. It w went through the traditional peer review of, of that journal. And so the academics who wrote it, they get the credit for having written that particular article that counts in their research evaluation but the public also benefits because this article is immediately um, openly licensed so can be reused in lots of context including on Wikipedia where it will actually be seen by lots of people and uh, because yeah people browse Wikipedia and Wikipedia also has a system of interlinking uh, which is much more intensive than the uh, citations between uh, scholarly articles and so it's much more easy to eventually end up at that relevant article and know it, this is the relevant article uh, than uh, through the uh, scholarly ecosystem where you never really know what is the most relevant article on any particular topic unless you are an expert already. Okay, I have about one minute left. Who wants to chime in and say something about uh, the topic during, during that remaining minute? <laughs> Nothing. Then we can we can also use uh, this to, um, by basically just think about the implications. Think about what else uh, could be done in terms of the integration between the two systems. And I thank you for attending here. Um, I'm very happy to dig deeper into any of this. As you saw, mm, this was an hour that quickly went away. Uh, I think we touched on useful things, but of course we haven't touched on uh, lots of details. So, for instance, the starting points uh, that I had envisaged were also those that I used for the logo of the session. Um, the research ecosystem and the uh, Wikimedia family. So here you have this entire Wikimedia ecosystem. Um, and 
each of these platforms engages with research in, in a certain way or in multiple ways. And then here you have one vision on, on the research ecosystem. And for each of the things mentioned in here, we could discuss things uh, or mechanisms by which they interact with the Wikimedia ecosystem. Um, so this session ends, but I hope this is but just... Daniel, the, Daniel yes? uh, just to say that there are um, other sessions on Wikimedia later in the festival. So yes. people can look out for those as well. You can just go through the uh, schedule and search Control F for Wiki and you will find a few more. Yeah, so Nether has got one, which is certainly worth um, uh, attending, and our own group are showing how to use Wikidata. So I actually think Wiki, uh, Wikimedia is the future of open scientific information. Well, let, let's leave it at that. Thanks, Peter, for the yep. summary. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the event.